I love Dar es Salaam. And I love being a part of the Love Dar campaign. In fact, I think this is our, our third year as a family that we've been in this church and able to be a part of the Love Dar uh, campaign. I, I love Dar. I, maybe not everything about it. I don't necessarily love the traffic. Can I get an amen? Okay. But, but I love the city. I love uh, the fact that that along with uh, some friends, Gil and Amy, there's one, we were able to um, start a Bible college and train pastors. There are some amazing churches and amazing church leaders throughout this country. And I love the fact that God has allowed us to be a part of that. I love that I can walk to the beach in less than 10 minutes. I don't know why I only do it like once or twice a year, but I love the fact that I can do that. I can't walk to the beach very easily from Indiana, where our home church is. I love Mchuzi. I love Mchuzi. I love beans and rice. I don't necessarily love Ugali, but I love beans and rice. I love the fact that, that every week I get to eat Tanzanian food. And I eat Ugali three or four times a week. Not my favorite, but that's okay because the other stuff is so good. I love the fact that, that I'm a part of, our family, we're a part of a, of a multi-ethnic church. And here in the five weeks of the Love Dar campaign, we've already heard from a, a, a Brit from South Africa and a Tanzanian. Now you're getting an American. We're even going to get a Canadian. That's pretty awesome. I love that. I love the fact that my children have attended a multi-ethnic school. And when they're in the States, my kids will actually say to me, like, Dad, I'm, I'm uncomfortable. Everybody's white. I also love that last night when I asked Bethany if I could mention her in my sermon, she said, yes, but you've got to give me chocolate for every time you mention me. So I'm going to see how many chocolate bars I can earn for my daughter this morning. Uh, I, I love the fact that this, this city has been changing and growing, and we came in 2005, and since 2005, we've seen so many changes. Oh, incredible changes. I, maybe for me, the, the most exciting is the fact that I can get Pepsi Diet now anywhere I go. Now, I know this is water, but drinking Pepsi while I'm preaching is probably not the best thing. I, I just love this city. I love Diet Pepsi. I love them choosy. And I love God. There's something really strange about this word love. When I can use one word to talk about my relationship with soda and my relationship with the creator of the universe. When I can talk about how much I love them choosy. And how much I love Jesus. And it's the same word. We don't even really know exactly what love means. This morning I asked my daughter, another candy bar. I asked my daughter, what does it mean to love the Lord? And she said, ah, Dad, that's a hard question. But why is it a hard question? Shouldn't we be able to answer, what does it mean to love the Lord? I, I, I think most of us, if we're believers, we, we answer that some way. But right now, if you had to stand up with a microphone and say, what does it mean to love the Lord? Would you have an e easy answer? I mean, we kind of know it. We kind of know what maybe loving the Lord isn't. But we don't always do a good job of loving the Lord. If you Google... Bible verses love the Lord. You know what you're going to get? You're going to get a whole lot of Bible verses about how God loves you and about how we're supposed to love one another. But there really aren't a whole lot of Bible verses that tell us how to love the Lord. And honestly, I think that's a good thing. Because I know what my heart is like. And if I had a list that said, if you want to love the Lord, do this, this, and this, it'd be easy to do this, this, and this. If I do those three things, I can tick the box. Great, I love the Lord, and it's all done. But the Bible doesn't 
do that. The Bible doesn't really give us a list like that. The topic today in the part of the, the uh, Love Dar campaign is, is loving the Lord. And so if you're looking for a list, if you want to know exactly what to do to love the Lord, well, I'm, I'm not really going to give you a list today. And you should be grateful for that. It's a good thing. It's a good thing that there's not some simple definition on here's what it means to love the Lord because then it would be so easy to do it and then whatever else we did wouldn't really matter. But now that I've said that the Bible doesn't say really a whole lot about what it means for us to love the Lord, I'm not saying it doesn't say anything. And it does. And I want to know what the Bible says about loving the Lord. I want to know how to love God better. If, as a believer, if I think that having a a good relationship with the Lord is important, then I should want to know what it means to love the Lord. I'm a husband. I'm a dad. What if I had no idea what it meant To love my daughter, to love my son, to love my wife. I'd probably do a pretty miserable job at it. Well, what about the idea of loving the Lord? Do we know what it means? What does it mean to love the Lord? Well, there's a few passages we can go to, but I can't think of anywhere better than than seeing what Jesus says about this. And if you, hopefully want to know a little better what it means to love the Lord, then let's see what Jesus says. Let's figure out what Jesus says about loving the Lord. And and again, Jesus is not going to give us a list. Do this and don't, don't do that. Follow these rules. Instead, we're going to find out that that loving the Lord demands our everything. Loving the Lord demands our everything. It's not something that we can come and do on Sunday morning and maybe when we go to home group. But loving the Lord demands our everything. At least that's what Jesus tells us. And so if Jesus is important to us, oh, we, we want to know what he says. And, and some of you might be here saying, I don't really know what you're talking about, loving the Lord. I'm not assuming that every single one of us in this room have a relationship with God. Some of us, we know about God, we've talked about God, maybe we grew up in the church. But deep down, we know we don't love the Lord. Don't worry, I'll talk to you today, and and you're going to have an opportunity today, later, this morning, to say, God, I love you, and I want you to be my God, and I want you to be at the absolute center of all that I am, of all that I do, of all that I think. So if that's you, if you're not sure today, you can listen to me, that's fine. But I pray that you would listen to Jesus. That you would listen. Should we see what Jesus says about this thing, loving the Lord? You got your Bible. Turn with me to Mark chapter 12. Now for those of you who normally come to this church, you're looking at this screen right here for Mark chapter 12, aren't you? (laughs) It's not there. And it's not because I was slow and didn't get my uh, slides to the PowerPoint, guys. Okay? But here's the deal. We're coming to church. This isn't the, the, the market. We're coming to church. If we're coming to church without a Bible, is there anything wrong with that? What if you went to school without your, your textbooks and your, your pen and your paper and you Oh, I'll just sit there and let the teacher say whatever. I know we've got some, some teachers in here. What would our teachers think if we did that? Okay? Also, when, when we're at home, there's, there's nobody who's going to be projecting Bible verses up on the wall. Okay? So I'm not saying it's a bad thing, but we need to know. We need to know how to use this book, and I'm actually going to talk more about that, that later. But turn with me to Mark chapter 12, and I realize a lot of you— Oh, I left my phone over there. A lot of you have the Bible on your phone. That's awesome. You should have the Bible on your phone if you've got a 
phone smart enough to do that. Okay? Why? Because we can have the Bible with us at all times. So turn to Mark uh, chapter 12, kind of more towards the end of uh, the, the Bible in the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. In Mark chapter 12, uh, we see a couple things going on, and we see Jesus interacting with uh, different people. And so we see here, starting in verse 18, this isn't our passage yet, we'll get to that in verse 28, but in verse 18, it, it, you see that Jesus is talking with these people called the Sadducees. Now, we'll talk about the Pharisees in just a moment. You've probably heard of the Pharisees. You might not have heard much about the Sadducees. The Bible doesn't tell us much about them. This is the only time in the Gospel of Mark that we read about the Sadducees. These were religious leaders focused on the temple, and they believed in the temple, and they believed in whatever was in in Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. We call that the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Old Testament. That's all they believed. Okay? And according to them, in those books, they didn't see evidence for the resurrection. They didn't see any evidence that after you die, there's still something coming. So they believed when you die, you're going into the dirt and that's it. So they thought they were going to trick Jesus with this question. And you can read through later. It's a great question. Jesus, he's not going to be tricked. He gives a great answer. And again, I'm not giving that to you so that you'll go back and look at it later. Okay? He gives a great answer. But his answer actually fits with what these other people thought. Those other people, those were the Pharisees. Now, the Pharisees, they, they did believe in, in uh, uh, they did accept the other books of the scriptures, which we would now call the Old Testament. For them, it was the only Bible they had. So they believed in those books. Uh, and so they believed in the resurrection, so they liked Jesus' answer. But what they really loved most of all was the law. The law. They loved to debate and talk about the different laws in the Bible. That, now, we've heard of, hopefully, we've heard of the Ten Commandments. Well, in addition to those Ten Commandments, they had all these other laws. In fact, they said that the Bible gave 614 laws. And they loved to debate on which ones were, were weighty, were heavy, and which ones were light. Which ones were more important or less. And then they also would do this thing where they would build all these other laws around the law so that they would make sure they didn't break any laws. So basically, again, this would be someone absolutely in love with the law. God, well, he gave us the law. We love the law. Now, it got ridiculous. It got absolutely ridiculous. Have you ever heard from the Ten Commandments that remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy? Have you heard that? The idea of having a Sabbath where, where the Lord created the earth in six days and on the seventh he rested. And then he established that pattern for us that, that uh, it's good to rest. Well, for the Pharisees, it wasn't just a pattern. It was law. And they were so committed to not doing any work on the Sabbath that they made all of these laws. Let me share my three favorite laws that they created. First, on the Sabbath, you could not spit. I don't write in spit here in church, okay? But you couldn't spit on the Sabbath. Do you know why not? It might hit the dirt and move the dirt, and you're working, you're tilling the soil. Okay? You couldn't look in the mirror, especially for women. You couldn't look in the mirror. Why? You might find a hair out of place or a gray hair and pull it out. And that would be work. I would have a lot of work to do if I had to pull out my gray hair. Okay, here's another one. You cannot carry things from one place to another on the Sabbath. So if your house is burning down, you got to let it burn down. You can't even take your clothes out. Ah! But if you go in and put on everything you own, all of your clothes, and go outside, well, that's not work because you're wearing them. We like to laugh at the Pharisees and how ridiculous they are, but we do it too. 
we do it too. There are churches that will tell you, if you don't tithe, you're not saved. Does the Bible say that? There's actually a denomination here in this city that says, if you want to know God, if you want a relationship with Him, you need to make a list of every sin you've ever committed in your entire life. You need to actually write it on paper. And then you need to confess every sin you've ever committed to the pastor. And then maybe you'll be able to be saved. Wow, we've got all sorts of crazy laws, and we're gonna, we can make fun of them, but we do it too. Might talk about that a little more later. But, but here's the setting now. This guy, this Pharisee, he comes to Jesus, and it says here in uh, starting again, Mark chapter 12, verse 28. One of the teachers of the law, Pharisees, he came and heard them debating. Noticing that Jesus had given them a good answer, he asked him, of all the commandments, which is the most important? The most important one, answered Jesus, is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this. Love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. Well said, teacher. <laughs> I like that he's given Jesus the thumbs up. Well said, teacher. You're right in saying that God is one and there's no other but him. To love him with all your heart, with all your understanding, with all your strength, to love your neighbor as yourself is more important than all burnt offerings and sacrifices. When Jesus saw he had answered wisely, he said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. And from then on, no one <laughs> dared ask him any more questions. So this guy came to ask Jesus a question. It says here in, in, in Mark that, that he heard Jesus give a good answer, okay? But still at this point in the story, you've got these religious leaders trying to trip Jesus up, trying to trick him, trying to get Jesus caught where he can't answer. So he asks him, which is the most important of all the commandments? Which one is the most important? thinking that Jesus is going to choose this one, but then they're going to be, say, be able to say, ah, no, you're wrong. There's this one. We're going to get Jesus. Okay. But Jesus does something different. What's the most important commandment? And what does he say? Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Now, if we don't really know what, what that means, it sure looks like Jesus isn't answering the question. Like, he asked which is the most important question. And he's saying, hey, God is one. That's a strange answer to the question of what's the most important commandment. But actually, when Jesus said, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, this isn't something that he was making up on the spot. He was actually quoting the scriptures. Does anyone know where in the Bible this comes from? Where does it come from? Deuteronomy chapter 6. So turn in your Bibles to Deuteronomy chapter 6. So we're going to be near the beginning of our Bibles. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. It's the fifth book in the, the Bible. So it's going to be right near the beginning. Right near the beginning. Deuteronomy chapter 6. And what Jesus was doing, Jesus was quoting from what's called the Shema. The Shema. And Shema is a Hebrew word. It just means hear. And if you remember what Jesus said, hear, O Israel, that word hear, it's what's called the Shema. This is probably the most quoted uh, verse from the Bible because every observant Jew, even until today, in the morning and in the evening, quotes this passage. And here's what it says. If you look in Deuteronomy chapter 6, and this is the, the Lord is uh, speaking uh, through Moses and there's a, a, a very interesting context for why this is happening, and you can look that up later. I'm not going to give you all the answers, okay? But in, in uh, Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4, here's what we just, we just heard. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk, walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. 
Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. So Jesus here is quoting from a very well-known, very beloved passage of uh, the Holy Scriptures. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. So when Jesus said to them, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, instantly this guy and the rest of the people listening, they would go back to this passage. Now, something that we don't really see in the word hear, we don't really understand what that word means. Biblically, the word hear, it meant hear and obey. Hear and obey. It's not enough to hear, right? I can hear my wife asking me to help with the dishes. But until I actually stand up and walk into the kitchen, nothing's happened, right? So hear and obey. So what, what Jesus is saying here is hear and obey, okay? And uh, we see this other times John chapter 14, what did Jesus say? If you love me, you'll keep my commandments. If you love me, keep my commandments. Okay, there's, there's something, obedience is important. Obedience is important here, but, but why? What are we hearing? Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. What does that mean? It's what it means. It means there's one God. And I'm going to stand in front of you today, and, and I know that, that the, the rest of the, the leaders here and the sermons you hear, we're going we're gonna to say something. We're going to say there's one God, and there's only one God, the God of the Bible. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, Trinity. If you heard of Trinity, what do we say? Who is God according to the Bible? There's one God. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And a couple other things about that. The Father is not the Son. The Son is not the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is not the Father. So when we say God is one, we understand this is a, it's a strange thing. Maybe you've studied this thing called the Trinity. And... Maybe someone said, oh, well, it's just like egg. You've got the white and the yolk and the shell. Well, every picture we can come up with Trinity, it falls short. It falls short of the beauty and the mystery of who God is. But today, it's not very popular to stand in front of someone and say, you know what? I believe there's one God. It's this God. Yahweh, that's his, his personal name. Yahweh, the God of the Bible. Other gods, we don't believe those are the true God. It's not a very popular thing to say, right? What do we say? Well, I have found my path. I found what works for me. Okay? I follow the God of the Bible. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Yeah, that one God, I follow him. But if you follow your God, that's okay. All paths lead the same place anyways, right? That's not what the Bible says. The Bible says there's one God. Only one God. This is not a message that culture wants to hear. In fact, if, if you say, and we've got people involved in, in universities, if you say in universities around the world today that I believe there's one God, I believe that Jesus is God, not only are you going to get mocked, people are going to tell you that it's offensive and you're hurting them for saying that there's only one God. You know what? Truth matters. Truth matters. How many of you want to go to your doctor and have your doctor say, you know, might be cancer. Might be that your kidney's failing. I'm not really sure. You've got to go seek the medication that you think, that, that, that's just right for you. 
does it matter? Does truth matter for a doctor? For your health? Absolutely. Let's take something less important. Building a house. Uh, you know, he thinks a foundation is important. I'm not so sure. I'm going to give it a shot without the foundation. How, what's going to happen to your house? When you build a house, truth matters. Why does truth matter everywhere else? Okay. Bethany is in chemistry with Mrs. Alex here. What if, Mrs. Alex, what if Bethany came to you and you asked her a question? You said, you know what? I don't really think that's the right answer. I think this is the right answer. And she says something totally wrong. Are you okay with that? No, of course not. She's saying, hmm, Bethany did that yesterday. No, okay? It doesn't work in chemistry class. It doesn't work in the hospital. It doesn't work when you build a house. Why in faith? How is it possible that all roads, that different roads can all lead to God? Let's use our minds. It doesn't make any sense. So that's why Jesus starts here. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. He, he needs to make sure we understand he's talking about the one God, Yahweh. And then what does he say? Back in Mark chapter 12, if you're still there in Deuteronomy, turn back to Mark chapter 12. Jesus says, okay, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. Love God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. Now, you've been saying, ah, good, I'm looking for a list. Now I know the four things. I need to love him with all my heart, with all my soul, with all my mind, with all my strength. Ah, that, that's not exactly what Jesus is trying to do here. What Jesus is saying is, you've got to love God with everything. Loving God demands your everything, everything about you. Now, having said that, I don't think Jesus was just making up words. Heart, soul, mind, strength, they mean something. What does it mean to love God with all your heart? Well, biblically, the idea of the heart, it's kind of your control center. It's what's, it's what's driving you, the choices you make, the things you say. Your, your emotions, your feelings, your will, kind of all of this stuff is filled up your heart. Is our heart important? Absolutely. Proverbs 4.23. Are you familiar with that? Above all else, what? Guard your heart because everything you do flows from it. If we fill our hearts with junk, junk is going to come out. If we're filling our hearts with God, then we're going to start living like him. If we're going to fill our lives with truth, our lives are going to start reflecting that truth. So deep down who we are, we need to love God from our heart. And then the second part here, love God with your soul. Now, you can Google it, and every article you read... I know, because I was just there. Every ar article you read is going to have a different understanding of what heart and soul are. Okay? So I I'm not going to get into a, a, a big thing like trying to separate them, because again, for Jesus, I don't think he's trying to separate them. But when you look at the idea of soul, this, this isn't, sometimes we think soul and spirit, we put those together. That's different. Soul more has to do with your breath. So I would say if this is your heart, and this is your soul. It kind, of, it kind of just expands a little bit. It's everything who you are. The idea that my entire being, my entire being should be loving God. Everything about who I am, my heart, my soul, my life, everything, I need to love God. The third one here, again, loving God with all your heart, Loving God with all your soul. The third one is, is love God with all your, all your mind. This one's a little easier to understand. Okay? What is it saying? It's saying that we need to, when we love God, we need to engage our intellect. We engage our thinking. 
earlier, I, I gave a very brief, I know that we're not in Bible school here, but I gave a very brief discussion on Trinity. Do you remember that? The Father is God, the Son is God, the Spirit is God. The Father is not the Son, the Son is not the Spirit, the Spirit is not the Father. Okay? Some of you were thinking, oh, this is kind of cool. Others were thinking, how does this have to do with loving God? Okay. It has to do with loving God because I want, which doesn't really matter, Jesus wants us to engage our mind when we love him. What does that mean? That means we love him with our minds. We love him by pursuing truth. Truth matters. Truth matters. To say, this is my truth and you can have your own truth, it doesn't make any sense. Now, if I say, I like drinking Diet Pepsi, and you say you like drinking Tango Easy, well, I know you're wrong because it's horrible. No, right? We can have different preferences, but if we ask the question, who is God? There can only be one answer. Right? I've got my Diet Pepsi bottle here, and what's inside of it? It's water. It's not Diet Pepsi. Most of you have seen Pepsi before. It's, it's dark, right? What if you said, oh, no, it, it's, it's, it's Diet Pepsi inside there. Well, let me check. Oh, well, that's water. Guess what? This is water. Simply thinking it's Diet Pepsi or saying it's Diet Pepsi doesn't make it Diet Pepsi. The idea that in faith, each of us can have our own idea of reality, it makes no sense. But somehow we live in a world where, where we say, ah, I have my truth, and you have your truth. Well, if they're opposing truths, it just it doesn't work. So what's Jesus saying? We need to love God with our mind. Truth is important. Let me ask you a question. When's the last time you studied the Bible? Uh, yeah, I might be pushing into an area that you're not really comfortable with. I'm not asking when's the last time you read your Bible, although maybe I should ask that as well. Okay? But when's the last time you studied the Bible? When's the last time you were reading something and you came to a passage and you said, huh, I don't know what this means. And then you determined to find it out. You went online. You grabbed a study Bible or some book. You asked a friend. You came to church, asked one of the leaders, when's the last time that when you were studying God's word, when you were studying the truth, or when you were reading it, you went and you tried to find an answer? That's, when, when we talk about the idea of loving God with our minds, we need to be pursuing truth. Recently, I had the opportunity to to go in an Uber on a Sunday and on a Monday, okay? And on the Sunday, if you don't know what an Uber is, it's, it's a taxi, basically. If you, Uber drivers here, I'm not uh, offending you. Uber's awesome. Woo, taxi. Okay. So um, I'm in this Uber Sunday morning going to church to visit my friend's church. I want to hear him preach. Okay? And as I'm talking to this driver, I told him I was a, a Bible teacher, and now we had a, a Bible school. He said, really? I really want to study theology. I said, oh, that's great. Tell me why you want to study theology. Well, I don't really know much about God, and I want to learn about him. I said, oh, you know, that's cool, but you don't actually have to go to Bible school. You can read the Bible. Let me ask you a question. How often do you read the Bible? And he didn't say anything. Said, okay. Maybe the language thing. Okay. How, how many times a week do you read the Bible? Well, maybe you should ask a month. That's what he said to me. I said, all right, how many times a month do you read the Bible? His response, maybe once. Okay. So help me understand. You're saying you want to go study theology, but not enough to actually open your own Bible more than once a month? Do you have kids? He said, yeah, I have a daughter. Do you want your daughter 
to know God? Yeah, I do. Do you want your daughter to know the Bible? Yeah, I do. Right? You're saying, you're saying you want to know God, but you're not willing to open his book. And, um, friend, it's, it's Sunday morning. You're choosing to work on Sunday morning instead of going to church, right? Yeah. So at the end of the ride, I, I prayed for him. I prayed that he would love God and love God's word more than anything else. Okay? The next day, I hopped in an Uber, going somewhere else, start talking to the guy. And I was telling him that I was a, a Bible teacher, and we're discussing. He said, said oh, I always, I always take a good book with me so that I can be learning. Because if you know anything about Uber, after you drop your passenger off, then you... You put it into your Uber app, and then you wait for another customer. And you might be sitting there for five minutes or 10 minutes or 20 minutes. So he said, I always have a book with me. And then as he's driving, he pulled out. Right now I'm reading this book on prayer. And then he said, but I always have my Bible with me too. So whenever the author mentions something from the Bible, I always check the Bible to make sure what he said is right. What a contrast between these two young men. Both of them saying, I want to know God more. And one of them sitting back doing nothing, and the other one actively searching the scriptures, actively trying to learn more. It matters. It matters what we put into our minds. It matters the idea of, of truth. We need truth. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to name a name right now. Some of us, we're watching Joel Osteen. Guess what? Joel Osteen is not giving you truth. Oh, but I'm so encouraged. I'm so encouraged when, when he's preaching. You know what Joel Osteen says? Joel Osteen says that you're a good person. And he says, say this with me. I am holy. I am good. I am beautiful. I am young. What does Jesus say about us? Does he say we're good deep down? If you want to turn back just a couple pages to Mark chapter 7. This is who we are on the inside. Uh, don't yet say, wait a minute, I'm a born again believer. Hold on a second. This is what Jesus says. Jesus says in Mark chapter 7 verse 20, what comes out of a person is what defiles them. For it is from within out of a person's heart that evil thoughts come. Sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance, and folly. All these evils come from inside and defile a person. Friends, we're not good. We're not good at our core. We're rotten. We're horrible inside. That's why we need Jesus. So if you've got teachers saying, you're wonderful, everything about you is great, they're not teaching the Bible. And by the way, Joel Osteen, Joel Osteen, you know what he says about himself? He says, I'm not a good Bible teacher. If you want to study the Bible, you should go somewhere else. Friends, I beg you. Why would we listen to sermons from someone who admits he's not good at teaching the Bible? Well, for him it's fine because he can go through entire sermons, the most popular sermon on, on the entire internet. Oprah loves this sermon. The most popular sermon is from Joel Osteen. After the very beginning, the whole sermon, he never mentions the name of Jesus. Friends, we need truth. Too many of the books out there are garbage. The preaching is garbage. But we don't know. We don't know that it's garbage because we don't know this book. Friends, I beg you, love this book. If we're going to love God with our minds, we need to know who he is. That's what Jesus was saying. That's why he said, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. He was trying to remind the people of the character of God if you're not exactly sure who God is, or you have people telling you things about God that just doesn't seem right, oh, friends, study this book. 
study this book. It will absolutely change your life. We need to love God with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our mind, with all of our strength. With all of our strength. And, you know, normally I don't talk a lot about the Greek and Hebrew, and I can't read Greek or Hebrew, whatever, but I can read things on the Internet. And and when Jesus said that we want to love God, that we need to love God with all of our strength, again, he's quoting from Deuteronomy chapter 6. He's quoting from the Shema. And you know what? What it says there, you know what Deuteronomy 6 actually says? Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your very. Love God with all of your very. Now, if English isn't your first language, and you're a little bit confused right now, don't worry, all of us are confused, because it doesn't really make sense. Love God with all your heart, with all your soul, and all your very. That's, grammatically, that's not good English. But what is God saying there? Again, this comes from Deuteronomy. This comes from God speaking through Moses. When you love God with all your heart, with all your soul, when you you love God with everything you are, love him to the very. Keep going. We can't love God enough. Now, it doesn't mean we can't love God enough for him to love us. God loves us. No matter our love for him, he still loves us. But the call is to love God with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our mind, with all of our very, with all of our strength, with everything we've got. Friends, there's nothing else worth giving your life to. There's nothing else as important as loving God with everything that you are. That's what Jesus says. He says the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. Again, this guy asked for one, which is the greatest commandment? Why did Jesus also say, Love your neighbor as yourself. That wasn't in the the Deuteronomy passage. That actually comes out of Leviticus, which is also in the Old Testament. But I think Jesus did that because he knew our hearts. Because of the wickedness inside of me, because of the deep, deep selfishness inside of me, I can somehow convince myself that I can love God and hate my neighbor. It's not an option. What does Jesus say? (laughs) Love God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Okay? You can't separate them. Okay? Really quickly, I just want to read this passage, this verse here. 1 John, whoever claims to love God yet hates a brother or sister is a liar. That's what the Bible tells us. If we say we love God and yet we hate our next-door neighbor, we're a liar. Disobedience, choosing to hate somebody, is choosing to not love God. They're connected, okay? I'm not going to say more about loving your neighbor because it's coming out in different sermons, but I do want to mention something else in this verse. The second is this, love your neighbor as yourself. Maybe you've heard this. You know what? You've got to love yourself. Once you can love yourself, once you're comfortable with who you are, then you can love your neighbor. Have you heard that before? Okay, it's coming out of churches. It's coming out of Christian books. Let me tell you where it's coming from. It's coming from the devil. Yeah, I actually hadn't planned on saying that earlier, okay? But that's where that message comes from. You don't need to love yourself. What is Jesus saying? I already know how much you love yourself. I want you to love your neighbor that much. Okay? If Jesus really was saying, love yourself, he would have said, love, your, love the Lord, love yourself, and love the neighbor. No, Jesus knew how selfish we were. Why do I get angry? Because I don't get what I want. Why am I jealous? Because I don't have what you have. Right? Why do we sin? 
because we think we're the center of our universe. Jesus already knows how much we love ourselves. Now, someone, you, you might say, you know what? But some people, they're, they're pretty discouraged and they, they need some more self-confidence. Hey, a couple things. First of all, looking inside yourself, it, it's going to fail because deep down you're not lovable. How do I know that? Because the Bible says that all of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Every single one of us is a sinner. If we look deep inside ourselves, we're going to see our selfishness and our greed and our pride and our lust. Those things are in there. What do we need to do instead? We need to look to the God who created us. We need to read the Bible and learn what God says about us. God loves us. Okay? I said we're unlovable. I, I believe that. But God loves me, and God has changed me so much that when he looks at me, he's pleased. I'm still not perfect. I still sin. But when he sees me, he's pleased. That happens only through Jesus Christ. He's, ah, oh, really? I don't think it's that bad of a thing to love yourself. Hey, 2 Timothy chapter 3, Paul says, Paul says to Timothy, Look out. Watch out for these false teachers. Watch out. In, in the last days, things, things are going to get bad. Why? People will be lovers of themselves. Lovers of themselves. That's not su such a bad thing. Well, read the rest of the list. Lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. If you try to love yourself, you're not going to be able to love God. I'm not telling you to hate yourself. That's not biblical either. We understand that we were created in the image of God. But we love God and we love others. And if we start loving God with everything that we are, and we start loving our neighbor, it's going to change how we feel about ourselves. Okay? So, we love God. We love our neighbor. And again, this guy said, well said, teacher. I'm in verse 32. You're right in saying that God is one and there's no other but him. To love him with all your heart, with all your understanding, with all your strength, to love your neighbor as yourself is more important than all burnt offerings and sacrifices. Loving God and loving people is more important than all of the religious activities that you do. I'm not telling you to stop coming to church. I'm not telling you to stop praying. But we come to church because we want to worship God together. We want to encourage one another. We want to learn from God's word. We don't come to church so that God will love us. Whether it's giving, giving our, our offerings in church, giving food to your next door neighbor, helping someone through their problem, whatever that is, we don't do these things so God will love us. We do these things out of a heart of just overwhelming gratitude for what God has done for us. And this guy, remember, law was mo most important to him. There was nothing else more important than the law. But he said, huh. Loving God and loving my neighbor, that's more important than all of my religious activities. Friends, if you come to church because that's something you're supposed to do, I encourage you to think about that and say, why am I coming to church? And if you're just coming to church because you're hoping God will like you if you come, it doesn't work that way. Okay? God loves you because he loves you. He made you. He wants a relationship with you. It's not dependent on the things that you do. So then Jesus said, oh, my friend, <laughs> you are not far. You are not far from the kingdom of God. He didn't say you're in the kingdom of God. Why? We might understand what God is saying. But until we've taken that step and entered into a relationship with, with God through Jesus Christ, we're not there yet. And I said earlier that maybe all this talk about loving God, you're like, I, I don't really know who God is. I don't know that 
I love God. I've talked a couple of times about having a relationship with God, and you might say, I don't even know what that, what that means. The invitation for you today is this. God knows your heart. He knows your sin. He knows that stuff inside of you that you don't want anyone else to see. God already knows that. And he loves you anyways. And he invites you into relationship with him. What God said is, is your sin, as I shared earlier, that all of us have sinned. Well, your sin deserves punishment. And that punishment is death. An eternal death. I know we don't like to talk about hell. Hell's in the Bible. Your sin is deserving of death. However, I've made a way for you where you don't need to suffer the the punishment that you deserve. I'm going to take your punishment and put it on Jesus. And when Jesus died on the cross, after three days he rose again, what Jesus did on the cross was enough. It was enough to cover every bad thing you've ever done, every bad thing you ever will do, and he loves you anyways. If you would say right now that you don't think you have a relationship with God like this, I encourage you, pray. Say, God, I want that relationship. Okay? I'm going to pray something. You can pray with me later, but copying my words doesn't mean anything. But you talking to the God who made you, that's what matters. Now, for the rest of us, those of us who who do know Jesus Christ, we learned some things here, didn't we? Let's, again, understand that, that loving God demands our everything. Everything about us. Are we spending time with God? The majority of Christians do not spend time with God every day. Here's what I want you to do for this week, just for one week. If you don't have a regular practice of spending time with God, I would ask you this week, take 10 minutes. Let's do it in the morning. You can do it in the evening sometimes with kids and work. It's, it's tough, but take 10 minutes. Open the Bible, read the Bible for five minutes, and pray for five minutes. It's like, what? Only 10 minutes? You're, you're saying we got to love God with our everything. Well, Let's start with 10 minutes. And if you don't know how to do that, you don't know how to sit down and open the Bible and, and, and pray, talk to somebody. Maybe someone brought you. Talk to Sheshir, one of the leaders. We would love to, to talk to you about that. Let's make sure that we're, that we're learning about him, that we're loving God with our mind. Theology is a beautiful thing. Find a good book and read it. Learn more about who God is. Learn more about this incredible salvation that he he offers us. Here's another one. We don't like to talk about this one, but obedience. Right? When Jesus said, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Understand who God is and then live your life based on that. We know we're sinners. We know that there are there are things that we're doing that we shouldn't. Well, each time that I sin, what I say is, God, I think I'm more important than you are. If we want to love God, if you want to love God, if I want to love God, I've got to stop sinning, okay? I'm not expecting perfection out of you or out of me. Okay? When we sin, we confess that sin. We repent, and repent means we turn away and we don't do that anymore. As I'm talking about obedience, my guess is most of us in this room, something popped into your mind. Something that you're doing, some attitude, some hatred you have for a person, something you're hiding that you don't want anyone else to know. Yeah, that thing that popped into your mind, that's that area where you need to to work on obedience. Obedience doesn't mean, ah, someday I'll stop that. Obedience says, God, today, I understand who you are, and no longer do I want to live my own way. I want to live for you. You stop, you turn, you move forward, a new life with God, okay? And then go. We've got to go. We've got to share this 
truth with our neighbor. Loving God and loving neighbor are, are not two separate things. We can't truly love God and hate our neighbor. I love the fact that this message is in the middle of the five weeks of the Love Dark campaign. This is the middle. This is the center. Everything about who we are, everything about loving this city, of loving the next generation, all of this, it comes out of our relationship with God. How do we love the Lord? How do we love God? Well, loving God demands our everything. Everything about who we are. Everything about what we think. Everything about what we do is focused on God. Lifting Him. Glorifying Him. Proclaiming Him to this city and to the nations. Let's pray. God, in this passage, you... Um, You set the bar pretty high. You say that we're supposed to love you with everything that we are. And God, that's so hard because I really love myself. And so many of my decisions, I make them because I want what's best for me. God, break that in me. Change my heart. Change the hearts of each one of us here. God, that we would love you more than anything. That we would love truth more than anything. God, that we would desire to love you to the very, that we would love you with every single thing that we are. And God, those things that you revealed to us, those areas where we're not loving you, where we're living in disobedience, God, I pray that we would not continue to walk in that way. But God, we would confess those sins. We would move forward in holiness. And God, if we feel we can't get out of that sin on our own, God, I pray that you would give us the courage to go tell a friend, that we would go tell someone, and that the body of Christ could help us to walk in truth, to walk in holiness. And Father, I pray for those who have come today who maybe don't know you. And if that's you, if that's you today, in your heart right now, I, I encourage you to pray something like this. God, know that I'm a sinner. I know that I make choices for me and not for you. But God, I understand that you created me. I understand that you love me. And God, thank you for sending your son, Jesus, to die on the cross so that I could be forgiven and have a relationship with you. Forgive me of my sins. Thank you, God, for making me one of your children. Oh, friends, I pray that we would love God more than anything. What would happen in this place? What would happen if every single one of us started to love God with our everything. What would happen here? What would happen in this city? Whew. I'm getting excited. Don't forget to come tonight. Next Gen Concert. I'll be sharing a little bit more about what it means to love God with our mind. There's going to be music. I don't know Arthur, you probably have an announcement. I'm getting excited. I'm giving your announcement. You can come up as well. We want to we love God with our bodies, with our voices, as we're singing, dancing. We're going to love God with our minds today as well.
Go for it. Arthur, thank you. Thank, thanks so much, Mark.